Hello, everyone. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I know you don't like the intros of these videos to be long, but I have to say this, as this is a very special video that I'm putting together for each and every one of you. First and foremost, thank you to Innerscare and Innerscare Wifey. If they hadn't pushed me out of my comfort zone, there would not be a Back to Ashes. I pay homage to them every single day and they're dear friends of mine. Secondly, thank all of you, every single one of you. I started this channel the last three days of January, I do believe it was. It blew up. Look at what it is now. I have nothing but the kindest, sweetest, most energetic and positive audience I never dreamed I would have. So thank each and every one of you for taking your time to listen to my material that bought me a coffee, that donated uh, money so I wouldn't be homeless this year. And all of the positive notes that everyone sends me, notes, comments, emails, thank you all so much. I'm literally just a guy sitting behind a microphone. Um, that likes to read to people. Um, I didn't think I had the talent for creating vocal melatonin, as I like to call it. I never thought I would be reading people to sleep, but all of you have proved me wrong. And for that, I am very humble and grateful and thank each and every last one of you. I say this word very rarely, so <laughs> please take it to heart. I love each and every single one of you. If I could give you a hug, I would. Providing sleep therapy for over 13,000 something odd people, I never thought I'd see the day. I never thought someone would say his voice is perfect to fall asleep to. So I can't say enough thank yous. But anyway, I'm going to shut up <laughs> as we close this last chapter of 2023 and we step into 2024 some changes are on the horizon and again thank you all for sticking with back to ashes i couldn't have asked for anything better you all keep the embers burning bright hence your nickname the embers even when i don't feel like narrating you all keep me going really if it weren't for you i'd be sitting here talking to the void <laughs> Um, I'm not going to edit this uh, beginning just simply because I wanted you all to hear me raw and true and not edited like I will do during the stories. Anyway, thank you all so much. And I'm so, so, so grateful and happy that I get to bring you in to the next chapter in this book that we call life. I couldn't be more proud to have you all with me in 2024 as I think Back to Ashes will explode even more. Within its first year, it is at almost 14,000 subscribers. I never thought I would see the day, but I thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. With that being said, I'm not gonna go through my regular spiel. All I'm gonna say is, this is a special dedication for you all and I can't wait to read to you next year. Cool. So sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snack. <laughs> We're tucking it warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled Goodbye 2023 Subscriber Dedicated True Stories. For those that did not vote on your favorite genre or how long you'd like this video to be, this video will be roughly five hours long and I will be reading the genres that everyone wanted me to read. So, thank you all. This one's for you. Please don't forget, I will be reading this in the Russian roulette style, meaning I will not be telling you which genre I'm reading. That will be for you to figure out. You ready? Let's get started. Hey, 
Let me say that to whoever is reading this to be very weary of your neighbors. When I was 12, I used to go to a summer camp with my cousin, who was six at the time. Let me backtrack a bit. My cousin is actually my mom's cousin because my grandmother's sister had her only kid, so even though I was older than her, she was my older cousin, if that makes sense. We both frequented our great-grandmother's house and ventured to the camp from her home. Now, there was an odd neighbor next to my great-grandmother's house. Let's call him Mike. My family had told me that he was a creep and had a history of people uncomfortable in the neighborhood, to the point where people purposefully avoided the street he lived on. Mike was also a man of few words, and he was older, I'd say maybe in his 50s or 60s, as he had visible gray hair. So one day me and my cousin, we'll call her Susan, were walking to the summer camp when I felt someone following us. So without alarming Susan, I quickly looked over my shoulder and at first didn't see anything until I noticed Mike walk from behind the car. I quickened my pace and pulled Susan along and cut through a walkway to see him pick up the pace. I couldn't scare my cousin, so I kept moving, darting between different pathways while trying to outpace Mike. Knowing that I was a few minutes away from the camp, I told my cousin to go through the gates while I turned to confront him. He stopped and looked at me and turned back. I immediately reported this to my parents and Susan's mom. They confronted him and he denied any wrongdoing and we threatened to call the cops. Now it's 2020 and he's long dead with his house being boarded up and torn down a relic if a time period. Me and my cousin are both adults now and that always haunts me. The fear of having to protect myself and my cousin brought out the fight or flight response. Always, always watch your neighbors. You never know who is watching you. I go to my grandparents' house. I will get one thing clear. The house is clearly haunted. Let me give some background. The house was built in the 1960s. It was built over a cemetery for African Americans before they were given rights and slavery was ended. But it has been a long time since people stopped putting corpses there. It is also by some very deep woods. All the houses were surrounded by the woods as I live in the southern country. I've seen some ghosts and spirits before, but it was when I was very little. I've also had paranormal experiences, and some were recent. I often hear knocking in places of the house that no one can get to due to the furniture. My great-grandmother, 76 and can barely walk, also lives with my grandparents, and she is a diabetic and very unable to move due to her weight. Her room is where I often hear the knocking coming from, but she is handicapped and is not able to get up without a walker or even knock on a wall. Why would anybody knock on a wall just to scare me? Apparently, I'm the only one who ever hears or notices it. We also have an attic. Sometimes things go missing, and often my cats just stare at nothing. But I've heard that animals can see ghosts, I get paranoid a lot, but not to an extent. A light fell from the ceiling once, very recent actually. It was only a few months ago. The light was new and recently installed, but it was definitely installed properly. So why would it randomly fall out of nowhere? We have an attic, but I can't even remember the last time someone went up into it. The light itself didn't fall, but the covering for it fell off, which is very weird. Nobody messed with it, and like I said, it was properly installed. The most recent experience I have had with the ghost or ghosts was over a year ago. July 4th, 2021 to be exact. 
Usually a lot of my family come over, and two specific cousins usually ask to stay the night, and only one is allowed to any time, and I chose the older one to stay the night because she's more fun. She's 14. She recently got a boyfriend, and so she was mostly on FaceTime with him. And I honestly wanted the night to end because of her ignoring me and being rude to impress her boyfriend. She wanted to go outside, and I was fine with it because we were finally doing something after hours. She decided it would be a funny time to mess with me and say she saw something by the woods in our neighbor's yard. So we would keep running up and then running back trying to get a closer look each time. Eventually, we got close enough to get a clear look and I saw something. It was a white skinny figure. It looked naked or had very little raggedy clothing and looked like it had white hair with lots of chunks ripped out. I couldn't see a face though because I'm practically blind and can't see that far away. I take a good 10 minutes to look at it, and when I finally said something about seeing it to my cousin, it started running toward us. I guess my cousin didn't see it because she didn't do anything until I screamed, and started running back to the back entrance of the house. I was wearing Birkenstocks and slept because of the slightly wet grass. I didn't look back once, and I just grabbed my shoe because it flew off and took the other one off then continued running. When I got back into the house, I locked the door and sat against it. So did my cousin. I told her everything and also got mad at her because she looked back at me and laughed when I fell. We continued sitting against it until we heard knocking on the door. We got scared and ran back to my room and I almost started crying. Quick update. It's been almost a year since I've posted this story and I've made some edits to it. I've only had about one other scare since then. I had a cousin over. It was a different one. We were sleeping in the living room together. She went to the kitchen, the hot spot for my experiences, to grab a drink, then turn the light off after that. We then noticed the light was turned on. It was late at night and nobody else was really awake. Why is the kitchen light on? I thought you turned it off when you came back, I asked her. Oh, I could have sworn I turned it off. I guess I imagined it, she replied. She went back to the kitchen and turned the light off. Jordan, I said. What? She answered. The kitchen light is still on. Have you not been turning it off? I asked. What? I just turned it off. I know I did, she answered. Well, it's on, and no one's awake. Who else would have turned it on? Are you too scared to turn the damn light off? I said. No, I'm not scared. I've been turning it off, she replied. Look, if you're embarrassed to admit it because you're older than me, that's totally fine, I said. Braley, I'm not lying. I'll turn it off again. Watch, you can even come with me to make sure, she said. Okay. I'll go with you. I went to the kitchen with her, and we turned the light off. The process repeated again, and we got a bit freaked out. Jordan, nobody's awake, right? I asked my cousin. No, just us. Why? She replied. Because the light's on again, I said. What? Uh, there's no way. She looked into the hallway and seen the light on. I entered the kitchen and turned it off. Then the back entrance slightly opened. It was as though someone didn't close it all the way, so I closed it. The light turned on again when I was in the kitchen. Jordan, why did you turn on the light? No reply. Jordan? Still no answer. I went into the living room, turning the light off behind me. Jordan, stop messing with me. She was asleep. I got paranoid and put two fingers directly under her nose to make sure she was breathing. She was. So I was relieved, then went to the restroom. I remembered how the light turned on again as I was shutting the door and got a little frightened. 
I finished my business, walked out into the hallway, and the light was on again. I walked into the kitchen, and the door was open again. I closed it, locked it, and checked the house in case I was locking someone in who shouldn't have been in there. No one, no one was there besides my sleeping family. I kept the kitchen light on because I was too scared to turn it off again at that point. My mother and I moved into a new house with my brother. I'm mostly alone because they both work. I'm scared at nighttime, and now I'm left always feeling paranoid. My friend from college told me a harrowing story that happened to her and her friends in high school. She is from Buffalo, New York, and often went on camping trips to local upstate campgrounds. When she was a senior, her and four of her friends went to a campsite fitted with rows of cabins on the water that people could rent. As the sun went down, the girls noticed that their neighbors, a few cabins down, a group of guys similar in age, were playing music and grooving around the campfire drinking beers. One of the guys asked them all if they wanted to join. Whenever they got over there and started hanging with the guys, everything seemed completely normal and they were having a good time. As the night progressed, one of the guys there started to get blackout drunk and eventually pulled out a revolver that he said belonged to his dad. He started waving it around and playing with it. This obviously freaked us out, his normal friends included. Eventually, he started pointing the gun to his head and laughing while his friends were yelling at him to put it away and how that wasn't funny. The girls at this point were fairly disturbed and told the guys that they should get back to their cabin and said their goodbyes. When they got back to their cabin, they all talked about how freaky that was and expressed concern for the drunk guy. They then moved on to other topics of conversation and forgot about it for the time being. A few hours later, sometime in the middle of the night, they heard a loud bang coming from the direction of their neighbor's cabin. Shortly after this, a barricade of cop cars showed up to the scene. One officer came to my friend's cabin and started asking them questions about the cabin they visited earlier that night. When my friend asked the officer what happened, he explained that the kid had shot himself in the head in front of his friends. They weren't able to discern if it was an accident or a suicide. My friend to this day still has PTSD over his incident and explained that she rarely goes camping anymore. Hey, so this is a long one with a lot to unpack, so I will try to make it as readable and chronological as I possibly can. I'll also have to describe this house quite a bit, as some of the features are important to the story, so I apologize for how long this gets. Basically, my family has had close friends for decades that went through a haunting. They've never lied to us. They've been wonderful loyal friends and neither of them are superstitious so when i tell you these stories from their experiences at their home i almost 100 percent believe them and i struggle with that because i have a very hard time in believing ghosts or a thing or whatever it stuck with me my whole life though and i tell everyone about it who was interested in hearing it Growing up, my family became acquainted with this husband and wife who bought an old Victorian home my parents originally looked at when we moved to the area. The parents hit it off really well with them and my family basically helped these two friends of ours fix up the place and completely remodeled it together over the span of a few years. Really great people who my family have loved and trusted for decades. They are practically family, and they don't have any kids, so it's like they have been my aunt and uncle most of my life now. 
So, my parents are from the Deep South and always joked with their friends about the home they purchased being super haunted. From here on, I'll call the wife T and the husband D. Just to preface, they both grew up in the Catholic Church and held a lot of resentment towards it and were agnostic. They didn't believe in any of the stuff my parents joked about at all and openly mocked the idea of it. For as long as they could, at least. The first few months, T and D were moved in. They actually had to live on the first floor of the house. The only room that was really suitable was this small room that was off of the kitchen, which was on the back of the house. This was actually a servant's room, and it was super creepy. It was small, had one door into it from the kitchen and one out of the back of the house into the backyard. The strangest part is, it had this wooden spiral staircase in a closet. One of the closet doors in the room opened to a small spiral staircase that was entirely enclosed in this dark space to the second and third floor. It was weird, but wasn't uncommon with higher end Victorian homes. That had servants' quarters. So, anyways, no one liked that staircase. After the first month or so, the staircase started making noises at night. It was mostly creaking and some squeaking that would wake T and D up. But one night, they woke up to footsteps and a loud cough coming from the closet staircase. They both thought it was an intruder, so D scrambled to the closet and up the staircase with a flashlight and hammer only to find nothing. He checked some of the exits at the top of the staircase and to the unfinished upper floors, but there was nothing there. When they told my parents about this, Dee told them there weren't footprints at all on the dusty steps of the stair, and it went back to bed that night. But every once in a while, they'd wake up to the same thing, and Dee would go up there to find out nothing. We found out, though, that one time T went up there with him, and she said that the upper floor rooms they checked smelled heavily of tobacco and vanilla, and they never had smelled that way during the day or at all before. Again, near any footsteps in the stair or the rooms, they would check. Eventually, they ended up tearing out the stair entirely as it had some moisture damage. So, during that time, they were living on the first floor. There was some other issues going on with their dog. They had this little chihuahua who would regularly growl at the foot of the bed at night, growl and bark at corners of the rooms day or night and often acted very skittish when it was normally a very happy and fun-loving dog. They chalked it up to moving into this new big home and having all this construction around and thought nothing of it until one day T was lounging in the front room watching TV and she heard their dog whimpering. This is kind of hard to describe, but the first floor ceiling was over 10 feet tall and many of the front rooms including the foyer and the dining room, which were separated by these grand wooden sliding doors that joined together to close. She walked to the dining room and found her dog stuck between two of the wooden sliding doors that had been opened, just enough for the dog to fit halfway through. The dog was really happy, though, and wagging its tail, but when she got closer to it, she recoiled, because she saw the dog's fur and skin moving back over and over like it was being petted. Then she noticed through the gap in the doors that the dog's front legs were in the air and it was like something was trying to pull it through. She yelled the dog's name and immediately the dog's front legs dropped and she scurried out from between the doors. This never happened again. But by this point, T was freaked out, and my parents stopped the ghost jokes entirely. If I'm losing you, don't worry. Things get way worse. A couple of years ago into remodeling, 
this place. They have the first two floors nearly remodeled and are living on the second floor, fixing up the basement and third story before they move on to redoing the outside of the home. During this time, things have calmed down for the most part. They still hear weird stuff at all times of the day, but it's a massive century-old home in the process of being remodeled. Noises happen. T and D are asleep at night on the second floor. The entire first floor is done. Most of the second floor is finished. And at this point, the house is starting to feel like a home. T wakes up in the middle of the night to very loud sounds coming from the first floor. It was music. Lots of people talking and laughing. Basically, it sounded like a huge party was going on. She doesn't remember what the music sounded like. Just that it and the people laughing and talking downstairs were loud enough that she could feel the vibrations and resonance of the sounds directly below their bedroom. Then it all just stops and goes silent before she hears sounds like there are a group of people walking up their grand staircase. This was a grand wooden staircase that had two different landings. I think you call it cantilevered. It sounds like 10 or more people are walking up the stairs together. By the time they make it to the first landing, it sounds like there are just a few people. And by the time the noises reach the top of the stairs, it only sounds like two people. T was scared to death and threw her head under the covers as she heard the footsteps approach the bedroom. And then her stomach dropped when she heard the door creak open. It was quiet at first, and then all of a sudden, she heard talking. She said it was like a conversation going on on the radio that was too low to hear and then was turned up to room volume. Once the voices were loud enough to understand, she quickly realized the voices were talking about her, and they were just at the foot of the bed. She said she heard the voice of two different women, one old and one young, and they sounded very angry. They were saying hurtful and awful things about T, how she looked, how she acted, what she wore. They went to say more awful things and how she needed to leave the house. T snapped at that moment and pulled the covers off her face and screamed her husband's name. When she pulled off the covers, she saw a short old woman and a tall, homely looking woman who was thin and in her 30s or 40s. And just as she had seen them, suddenly they were just not there. She said she only saw a flash of them, but got a good enough look to see how mad they were. Next thing that happened was her husband rolling over and saying, Did you fucking hear that? D apparently never heard the party downstairs, but from the moment the bedroom door opened, he heard the full conversation the two women were having about his wife. From that point, D absolutely knew something was going on, but he was a really stoic guy and just ignored it. If you don't think about it, it doesn't exist. T was fully aware she wasn't going insane, and there indeed was something very wrong with the house that she had no explanation for, and she was scared to live there from that point on. And she felt watched in every single room, she was in. Now we get to the worst night. And I honestly don't know the entire story as he does not tell it often, if at all. And what I did hear was from my mom when I was old enough to hear it. If I didn't mention it before, her husband D worked construction. He was a mason and was doing a job about an hour and a half away from town and ended up getting snowed in one winter during a really bad blizzard. We had it in like 95 or 96. So this left T home alone that night during the blizzard with the house and their two dogs. So what I remember of the night was waking up at a time I was not allowed to be up at all because the front doorbell was having a fit which got our dogs barking. 
My dad was out of town at that time. So my mom went to the front door with a pistol and our dog. Turned on the front porch light to see tea and a coat and her nightgown and rubber boots. Absolutely peeking down and seeing her collapse with my mom holding and rocking her. I don't remember how much time passed that night, but I do remember T calming down and some police came over and that's when my mom checked on me and put me back to bed. So, years and years later, when I was old enough, I asked mom about the story and here's what my mom told me had happened that night. T told her that she was in bed with her chihuahua and their second dog they had gotten by now which was a big chocolate lab. The house is mostly remodeled at this point, and they turned that second floor bedroom into their master bedroom. It was time for bed, and she was watching the news, and then there is a loud boom and the house shakes. Sounds like the ceiling falling out in one of the rooms of the house, which was something they always worried about before they finished the remodeling. The dogs got spooked and run out of the room into the hallway barking. And as she's getting up out of bed to go see what happened, the door to the room slams. She said there was an awful droning noise that hurt her ears and the whole room filled with pressure and every corner and edge of the room looked dark. Like the room was lit, but for some reason the light wasn't reaching the entire room anymore. The TV started blaring static. Her head was pounding, and she said the room just turned red like someone snapped their fingers. I have a really hard time believing any of this as I'm agnostic and loathe religion. But here's what she said happened next. She looks up at the light on the ceiling when the room turned red, and she saw that the ceiling light was the cause of the changing color of the room. The ceiling light was an old wired chandelier that had many electric candle-like bulbs on spokes. Each candle bulb had changed into a Virgin Mary statue, and it was glowing red. She screamed, and the statuette started melting and dripping on the bed. She was able to scramble to the door, and thankfully the door was open without a fuss. She ran downstairs, and when she made it to the second landing, something grabbed her and pushed her against the wall before she fell the last few steps below the landing. She jumped into the boots and first jacket next to the door and ran out into the blizzard, scared out of her mind, leaving the front door wide open and the dogs behind. We lived about a minute or two's drive from her home so it was probably a little over a mile away, and that was honestly one of the biggest blizzards I've ever seen in my life in the Midwest. She ran hysterical through all of that to our front door in the middle of the night before collapsing in our foyer. My mom was convinced there was an intruder and T had been assaulted, so mom called the police, who took a while to get there. The officers who responded called the police chief who lived a few streets down from T's home. He walked on over there in the storm and checked out the house to see about the dogs. He said the front door was wide open and all the lights in the house were on. Every single one. Even the table lamps. He found the dogs and they were just fine. They were in the kitchen hiding under the table together. He checked every room and every closet, walked the grounds around the house, and found no prints in the snow, besides his and T's. The only snow in the house was what had been tracked inside, and what had accumulated at the entryway while the door was left open. The police brought the dogs over to our house later, and T stayed at ours the rest of the night and the next day until the roads were clear enough for D to make it back to town and pick up his wife. This really shook T up, and at this point, they were ready to part with the house and take the loss. She contacted the Catholic Church in town in a moment of desperation for someone to maybe come by and say some sermon or bring some holy water. Who knows? She was desperate. 
They laughed at her and said they didn't really do that stuff and ghosts aren't real, which I kind of can't blame them. The Presbyterian preacher in town, though, agreed to walk around the rooms saying some words from the Bible, and he did. When he was leaving, he asked T and D if they had asked the ghosts to leave yet. He said, if you tell them you don't want them there, maybe they'll just leave. So they did. They went in every room and said that they did not want them there, and they want them gone, and that if T and D didn't get to finish remodeling the house, the city was ready to condemn it and tear it down. Things stopped happening overnight. They ended up finishing the basement and the third story, and the last thing to do was finish up the outside of the house. When they wanted to get ideas for what to paint the front porch and second floor outdoor balcony, they had my sister take a bunch of pictures of the front and side of the house to visualize the paint schemes. My sister had an older camera, so she had to get the film developed, and when she did, she noticed some startling things. And I actually got to see these pictures with my own eyes as a kid. My sister was freaking out about it before giving them to T&D. The first floor of the house had this massive parlor with huge windows out into the front and side yard. The developed film showed both windows of the front parlor, and in it you can see men in period clothing with bowler hats in multiple pictures. In the pictures taken from the front of the house, they are actually staring out at the camera. You could see their expressions and everything. I remember thinking it was unreal at nine years old, and there was no way. But there it was. From the shots of the men in the parlor, it appeared that they were smoking or they were shrouded in mist. We later learned that room was a smoking parlor at one time. There was one other part of the house that revealed something in the developed film, and that was the second floor outdoor balcony. The room that exited out into the balcony from the second floor had a normal door, and then a screened window storm door on the outside. In every single shot my sister got at that balcony, there is a little girl with a large poofy dress and big bow in her hair phased into the door, like she is stuck halfway in it. Nothing spooky was happening anymore, but TND were done with the remodeling at this point and ready to get out of the home. Once the house was put on the market, though, some of the stuff started up again. They would hear someone running around upstairs in the front room they had access to, the outdoor balcony. And sometimes T said she'd hear something like a little girl humming to herself or a ball bouncing around that wasn't there. Of course, everyone decided it was the little girl from the photos we took during remodeling. So... That's the story. I've got one more small thing we heard about happening after they sold the house, though. I guess T ran into the family that bought the home at the grocery store later on. The lady who bought T's house actually asked if there was anything weird that happened when T and D were living there. T said maybe and asked what she meant, and I guess the new homeowners were having trouble with their young daughter. Her grades were slipping in school, and she was normally a straight-A kid. So the teacher called a conference with the parents and let her know she was falling asleep in class all the time. When the parents asked her daughter about it, she said she couldn't sleep at night because that was when the little girl would want to play with her. T told her to go around the house and tell them to leave and they'll stop. Never heard anything again about the house after that. There are some interesting things and details to still tell about the house, if any of you are interested. I know I've probably already bored you all to death, but I had a lot of fun writing this out and going through these old stories again. I still don't know what to say to this day in my 30s. It'll be a hell of a thing for TND to make all of this up, and they'd have to 
been pretty damn committed to it. They're pretty much just straight shooting, kind, loving people, and have always been very close friends. Really hard for me to believe that TND said about the home, but just as hard for me to believe. They'd lie about it so many things and be so seriously distraught over it. TND haven't lived in this house for around 20 years now. They are still just as confused as we are about the whole damn thing. It's a lifetime away from them now, but it's still something that they don't ever joke about. But occasionally they will talk about it, and they are always serious when they do. Pretty sure T and D are still agnostic as well. They just have no idea how to explain what they went through, and for the most part, just leave it in the past. All right, here's some context. I was living in Fiji Islands back in 2016, and I was 14 years old. This story happened to be my family, but mainly my mom lived it. It was on the 31st of October, and I was at school for a Halloween-based party, and my parents and my little sister were gone to a family friend's Halloween party. So the house was empty. My party finished at 9 p.m., and my dad came to pick me up, but dropped me and my mom and sister off at the house because our security alarm was ringing. Because nobody was home, my family obviously called the security company over, and they sent a van over with three security guards. My mom opens the house and lets everyone in. They check the whole house, and they see no one. My mother checks all the cupboards and under the bed with my little sister, who was only 12 at the time. The security went outside in the garden and in the basement to check if there was anyone. And it's not an accidental ring. We do not have any pets, by the way. My mom turns on all the lights from the living room and the balcony. She starts to open the window and the gates that protect all the windows to get onto the balcony. But when she looks at the keyhole to put it in, she notices flip-flops on the floor. She then looks closer, and she sees two pair of legs hiding really close to each other against the wall under a garden sofa. Look at the schema of the balcony to understand what they were. My mom screams at the top of her lungs. They are on the balcony. They are on the balcony. And the two guys got scared and jumped off the balcony into my garden. One of the guards grabbed the guy, but the second intruder jumps on the guard, and they ran away, jumping over the fence and running into the forest. My mother regrets yelling that if she came down and talked to the security quietly, the guys wouldn't have ran and probably been caught. My mother is crying, holding my sister to her side and telling her everything will be okay. The security then called the police, and they did a report described the guys, and started a search. The cops were here in a minute since I live 100 meters from the closest police station. The guys who jumped lost a hat and their flip-flops, and they left socks to use as gloves, along with two knives. Also, one of the thieves legit shit in our garden. Sadly, the guys were never found again, but two weeks later, my mom pulls out of the driveway looking into the rear mirror of her car, and sees 90% sure the two guys, their opposite our house, staring at her. The short one had the same new hat, and the other guy had brand new flip-flops. When my mom drove away to the police station, the guys were gone, and never to be found again. I got home after, with my dad, to my mom and my sister crying. My dad was mad that he didn't stay, but my mom had drank and could not drive. Luckily, my mom saw them before she opened the window. Otherwise, what could have happened? Now, how did two guys get onto the balcony? Well, it is going to sound stupid, but right next to the balcony where they were hiding, there are like two wooden poles linked with a weird plank 
It is not to hang any clothes or whatever, but it was just there. My dad asked the landlord to get rid of it, but the landlord did not want to. To give you a bit more information about the pole thingy, me being 15 or 16, when I was already six foot, I could jump and climb onto my own balcony because I did it to sneak out of the house to go see my girlfriend at the time. I'm now 21 and live in Australia, and even though I did not live for myself, it really scared me because I was young. And now that I live alone, I check the entirety of my house and make sure my phone is always locked to the point I lock myself out of my own home too many times. And being a fan of stories like this, my parents and sister moved on but me. Dominique Mays behind bars for killing his estranged wife, Amber Owens, whose body was found in a ditch. Dominique Mays is behind bars for killing his estranged wife, Amber Owens, whose body was found in a ditch in Montgomery County, Ohio. In the summer of 2014, Owens moved out of the home she shared with her husband and moved in with her grandparents on Elm Grove Drive in Harrison Township. She also took her daughter with her, as well as the two boys she had with Mays. According to the Dayton Daily News, Mays and Owens had a volatile relationship. He was arrested and charged with felony domestic violence in 2013, and Owens had a temporary protection order against him. Since he was not indicted by a grand jury, the charges were dropped. On October 21, 2014, Owens went missing. She told a relative she was going to the convenience store to purchase diapers and milk for her children, but she never returned. She didn't show up for work at Waffle House either. Owens' relatives filed a missing persons report three days later, which prompted a search by law enforcement and relatives. She has a full-time job, she's a mother of three, and she's very family-oriented, said Major Daryl Wilson of the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. And this is definitely not in her character. On November 4th, authorities found Williams' vehicle abandoned on Arlene Avenue in Dayton. At around 2 p.m. on December 4, 2014, Owens was found dead. Montgomery County road crews found her decomposed body in a ditch along Post Town Road in Trotwood. The Montgomery County Coroner's Office identified Owens through fingerprints. She was 23 years old at the time of her death, which detectives were investigating as a homicide. It was reported that Owens' relatives immediately believed that Mays had something to do with her death because of the type of relationship they had. They also stated that when they were out looking for Owens, he was not involved in the search. In an interview, he stated that although he and his estranged wife had a volatile relationship, he did not harm her. He also mentioned that he didn't help search for her because he didn't get along with the Owens' family. I know I love my wife and I know she loved me. I have no reason to kill her, May said. Why would I kill her and spend the rest of my life in prison? On December 12th, Owens was laid to rest. Her funeral service was held at the Ethan Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church in the 4,000 block of Shiloh Springs Road. Hundreds of people were in attendance, including Mays, who sat in front of the church with his son on his lap. According to WHIO TV7, Owens' family asked him not to attend the funeral, but he showed up anyway, and when he did, they did not ask him to leave. In April 2015, the Montgomery Prosecutor's Office announced that Mays had been arrested in connection with Owens' disappearance and death. He was charged with murder, involuntary manslaughter, felonous assault, abduction, domestic violence, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with evidence. 
Mays was booked into the Montgomery County Jail, where he was held on a $1 million bond. The details surrounding Owens' cause of death will not be released to the public following a plea deal Mays made with prosecutors. He also avoided a trial. I personally did not want to go through the trial. It would have been so devastating with all the elements and details, said the woman who raised Owens. On June 15, 2016, Mays was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, felonious assault, abduction, gross abuse of a corpse, and several other charges. Mays was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Phil Plummer, the Montgomery County Sheriff, released the following statement. Quote, the Sheriff's Office is pleased with the sentencing of Dominique Mays. This was a cold, calculated murder where he left three young children growing up without their mother. I would like to thank both the sheriff's detectives as well as the Montgomery County Prosecutor's Office for their hard work on the senseless murder. Mays is serving his sentence at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Scioto County, Ohio. My mom is a trucker. This is her story. She was driving through Arizona when she saw what she thought was leaves blowing across the road in the distance. This puzzled her since there's mostly pine trees in northern Arizona. When she finally got to the leaves, she realized that they were migrating tarantulas. Thousands of them. There was so many of them that her truck was sliding on their guts so she had to slow down. She stopped at the first truck stop and told her co-driver to fuel up. He was sleeping at the time because she wasn't going to step foot outside after what she had just seen. Her co-driver was pissed since it was technically his time off and he thought she was crazy until he saw the tarantula guts and legs caked inside the wheel well of the truck. She also outran a tornado in the Midwest. She was about to pull over and take cover until she saw another big rig that was parked on the side of the road get tossed a couple hundred yards like a toy. She called me and told me that she thought she was going to die and wanted her last words to be, I love you, to me. She pulled off the freeway and got to a Walmart where she ran into the basement where all the staff and customers were taking shelter. After the tornado passed, they stepped out of the basement and into daylight, since the Walmart was destroyed. She has many, many more stories like this. Trucking is 90% boredom, 10% insane shit, just like this. I used to work with wildlife conservation and anti-poaching teams throughout sub-Saharan Africa as an ecologist and ranger, so I have lots of stories. The thing that always bothered me the most were leopards. In one reserve, we had a local guy who ran his own small guiding business. He would cruise around in his 80s land cruiser, packed full with tourists, and was notorious for breaking the rules i.e. no off-trail driving, don't get too close to the animals, etc. Which is probably why people always booked him because they almost always saw more. Anyway, one day he stopped his cruiser on a concrete and iron bridge that carried its users over a creek that swelled and cascaded through the valley during the wet season. It was dry season, so the creek bed was cracked and bone dry. He led his passengers out to take pictures down the creek bed. It was a rather scenic spot. He said he had to take a leak, so he walked to the far side of the bridge and disappeared under the spot where the bridge connected to the top of the beam that slowly sloped 30 feet down to the bottom of the creek bed. Next thing the tourists snapping pics on the bridge see is a massive leopard bound out from under the bridge, 
carrying the guide's body by his neck. As soon as it appeared, it vanished, and a body was never found. All they located was a pack of cigarettes and a lighter he must have dropped during the attack. His last act of rule-breaking got him killed. In a different location, a young tourist on vacation with her family slept on the open-air second floor of the lodge they'd rented despite being told not to. In the morning, her family came out to find the shredded hammock, pieces of clothes, and blood. They eventually found out what was left of her stuck into a tree not too far away. This definitely falls into the strangest category. I was solo pitching for a long weekend in the Pacific Northwest, and one day was in the rare part of the trail that is closer to civilization, so there was a higher chance of other hikers and campers being around. I saw one or two people, but mostly from afar, and as it was nightfall soon and getting cold, and I was getting deeper into the woods, I knew the odds of seeing someone else was highly unlikely. I was hiking around the small pond and was going to set up camp nearby when I heard some shuffling noises behind a small boulder or rock wall type of thing. It was a repetitive noise and got louder and then quieter, but never stopped at all. And basically, if you're a regular hiker, you know a noise that does not fit into the woods when you hear it. I took out my two knives that I carry when hiking and slowly walked around the boulder, honestly not knowing what I would see. What I did not expect and was very shocked to see was a very attractive couple in their 20s having very aggressive but happy doggy style sex on a blanket. Obviously, they were as shocked as I was to see one another, and they freaked out and yelled, as did I. And, as they covered their bodies and their clothes in a panic, I awkwardly apologized, picked up all my gear, and just sort of jogged off into the woods. Passing their tent, they had pitched along the way. Same way I had seen the tent the dude had, pa <laughs> had pitched in his nether regions. <laughs> Also, in another part of the country, I thought I saw a bear once, and it turned out to be a giant pile of mud. I wonder if that couple is still together, and if they tell that story when they got drunk at parties. You know, like I do. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to Goodbye 2023 Subscriber Dedicated True Stories. I do know I told you it was going to be five hours long. This one is to be continued. To kick off 2024, the very first video will be the last four hours of this one. Maybe longer. Until then, please take care of yourselves, and I'll be reading to you next year. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.